For our next hand building concept, we are working on coil vessels, more specifically a coil vase form. You are going to create a form similar to this. It's going to be in the end approximately 8 to 12 inches in height and it's going to be a combination piece. In other words, a portion of it is going to be coil constructed and another portion of it is going to use another process. The two processes that may create the base of the coil base could include a thrown form like this. It is thrown and trimmed. And so you would start with a very basic bowl form that you can then build onto. Or you could use a pinch pot form as your base. Either one works absolutely wonderfully for this concept. To have it created your base, either thrown or pinched, you then want to start brainstorming for vase shapes. You're going to, in your sketchbook, sketch that base shape at least three times. You can choose to sketch additional if you would like, but at least three. So in my sketchbook, I have an example right here. These top three sketches are vase shapes based upon the throne bowl form that I have created. So once I have sketched three possible shapes, I'm then going to put a star next to the shape that I like the most. If you're really stumped on figuring out a vase shape that you like, I encourage you to just do a simple Google Images search of vases. It does not have to be a ceramic vase that inspires your shape. It can be any media. So play around a little bit with forms, and you may need to sketch more than three to arrive at one. If you do that, that's absolutely fine. Once you have established what shape you would like to create, you're then going to make a full-scale drawing. This is an example of a full-scale drawing that should be about 8 to 12 inches in height. What I'm looking for for this lesson is creativity in your coil use. You may also consider integrating some design, some relief work, some carving in the base of the form. For example, in this coil vase, I went ahead and after I got some coils constructed, I carved away and even pierced some areas in the form that relate to the top section. I also created a fun little foot that I'm going to demonstrate for you a little bit later on how to create that. So these arches relate really well to the repetition of curves throughout the form. What I'm going to be looking for for a well-crafted coil is that each end of the coil comes to a point as you're rolling. So when I demonstrate rolling a coil, you'll see that I very purposely end and begin each coil with points. That really helps with the transition when you're building form. You can be super playful in how you fold and roll, co roll coils. You can even have coils that jet out of the form, project out. So one of the things that I am looking for for this coil vessel is again creativity, that you're being playful with your coil use. So I'm going to show you in several different constructions various ways that you can integrate playing around with coils. So I want to show you some additional examples of how I apply creativity to coil construction. On this form, you can see that I integrated a great deal of negative space or piercings in the form with just a simple loop design. On this piece, I also kind of drooped a coil down onto that base form to help relate the base form to the rest of the base. I chose to not alter the foot ring in this construction. On this piece, this is a work in progress, I have altered the foot ring and I also have coils popping or jetting out of the form. That one started to sag a little bit. But this gives a lot of three-dimensional quality to the work. And you can also see that I'm starting to now carve into the form. I'm going to be doing more of this throughout. And finally, this is an example of integrating stamping little clay beads or buttons as well as almost like a teardrop shape coil into the work. So there's a lot of different ways that you can play around with coil use. 
the one thing that is relatively constant is the craftsmanship of my coils. That when you look closely, you can see that the ends of the coils come to a point. This helps immensely in transitioning from coil to coil. Next, I wanna show you how to alter the foot ring if you choose to do so. This is absolutely optional. So this is what it will look like. It's almost like a little uh, arch in the foot. So you can use the handle of a tool such as a hammer to paddle into the clay. I'm choosing to use what we call a throwing stick. This tool is actually designed to help reach into tall and narrow forms to pull up walls. So I'm just going to use this as a paddle and tap that foot ring and create a really nice arch. I started with this idea one day when I had actually ruined a foot ring. It became very sloppy and asymmetrical. And so I played around with ways to alter it. So it's a really fun way to bring unity in the foot with what's happening at the top of the form. You can alter your foot ring really at any point. A lot of mine were altered much later when I had built the coils up pretty tall. I just held the form to the side and tapped. So you don't have to do this right at the beginning, uh, but you can choose to start off that way if you would like. Now that I have created my sketches, finalized my idea, I'm ready to actually create form, there are several tools that you're going to need to create your form. If you have a scoring tool or a cross-hatching tool, I recommend grabbing that. But you can also use a um, needle tool if you would like. You also need a cleanup tool. You'll be using this a lot, as well as your sponge and a wood sculpting tool, or you could use a popsicle stick. If you don't have a popsicle stick laying around your house, eat more popsicles. No, just kidding. You can actually also use the handle of a piece of silverware or other long slender things that you could use to smooth form. So look around your house and see what you could find. So I wanna start with a cross hatching review. So I'm gonna angle the camera down and I'm gonna show you how deeply I'm going to cross hatch this form. So as I'm cross hatching, I wanna hold the bowl or hold the pinch pot by the wall to add support from the pressure of cross hatching. And you wanna dip your tool as you go. That is the slip. There's water getting in all those grooves. This cross hatching should be sloppy. I should see a lot of torn edges. That's how you know you're doing it right. So you wanna cross hatch quite deeply. So you can see how deep that mark making is. So now I'm ready to attach coils. When it comes to rolling coils, you wanna start with using a little bit of clay at a time. I'm really looking for strong craftsmanship. So you wanna start off by rolling it in your palms and then place it on the table surface and roll bringing the ends to points. That will really help with the craftsmanship and transitioning from coil to coil as well as from coil to the bowl form itself. If you have areas that are a little bit thicker, you can go ahead and concentrate on rolling a little bit more in those areas to get a more consistent coil. If you notice, whenever I'm rolling on the table surface, I'm just using my fingertips and I'm spreading my fingers as I go. That really helps with the craftsmanship to get a nice consistent coil. You wanna focus on your coil being no thicker than that of a traditional pencil. So now I applied a little bit of water with my sponge, the side of the coil that I'm going to press into my cross hatched area. So I'm going to press down firmly. Now, the pressing down is essential. If you do not take the time to push down, then your form will easily pull apart. Since I'm working with nice soft clay, I actually do not need to cross hatch between each soft coil, but you always must cross hatch between a day's work. 
So tomorrow when I pick up with this, or if I work on it later today when it's leather hard, I'm going to need to cross hatch that connection again because of the clay's soft versus leather hard status. So I'm going to roll my next coil and I'm gonna start getting a little bit more creative with these coils. I am going to do a loop design for this. Bringing those ends to a point. Taking my sponge, applying moisture. Now, notice I did not cross hatch because that clay is already super soft, but I do need to press down. To unify the coil vessel with the form, I'm going to add an element of dropping that line down below the rim. So those coils dropping below the rim become very decorative and it helps to unify those arches I have on the base with the surface of the form. Notice that my clay, as I'm working, stays in the bag sealed up. Especially during winter months when the air is really dry, the clay is going to dry out really quickly. Same thing goes with your form that is in progress. Never ever leave that out for a long period of time unless you're working on it. So now, to add a little bit of moisture to that surface and I'm going to connect the next coil. Also notice that I'm very careful about not allowing any water to puddle in the bottom of this form. In other words, you don't, as you're adding water and slipping, want to have water collect in the bottom. That will break down the bottom of your form. That's just as detrimental to your piece as leaving it dry out. If you have a water bottle around your house, I recommend pulling that out and keeping that in your workstation. That'll help maintain moisture. Now, for the sake of time, I wanna go ahead and jump ahead and show you how to smooth out that interior. You're going to use a dry rib tool for this step support the outside and smooth the inside together. Do not smooth the exterior coils together. Those are going to remain decorative on this form. So we want those to be very visible. So now once I've added a couple coils, I have them smoothed together. I'm now going to do a loop and a coil to really begin the design aspect of this form. And I'm rolling those ends to a point and then I can focus on the center. If you end up where you have almost like a little oval type shape in your coil, you can easily fix that by just placing it on the table surface and carefully rocking it back and forth to a round so I'm going to add a little bit of moisture to this coil and I'm going to begin looping and I'm going to go ahead and loop this end as well then I can add it to my form. So make sure you're taking the time to press down. Now, 
as I'm working these little loops that I added, they will begin to sag quite easily. So I actually use the handle of a tool or the handle of a paintbrush to lift them as needed. But I'm going to be plugging in some little clay balls that will help support that as a decorative element to it. So I'm going to smooth out this interior. That is what gives those coils strength to remain together. So now let's talk about the refinement of the outside. Do you see all those transitions between lines, how sloppy that is? That is what I'm going to use that cleanup tool for. This is exactly how the cleanup tool got its name. So I'm going to dip the cleanup tool in water and I'm going to glide the back side of that cleanup tool between the coils that are sloppy. You will be doing a couple different things here. You're going to be removing excess clay and scraps, and you're also going to be clarifying line. You want to see the lines dividing areas of the form. That is the decorative aspect of this. So you can actually use this tool to shave off pieces of clay that you no longer need. Emphasize line. So you're going to go back and forth between using this tool and your sponge to refine. So I've refined that bottom line with the cleanup tool. I'm now going to go in with the edge of the sponge and continue to refine. So you can see the difference already in the refinement. Now going to get this tricky area between those lower coils and show you what that will look like. Always make sure that you're saving enough time Time at the end of working to get caught up on smoothing the inside and refining. You want to make sure that you smooth the interior of your pot and do the general refining of the exterior prior to bagging it up for the day. So at this point, I'm at a stopping point where I need to stop working for today and I will pick up with it tomorrow. So what I'm going to do is since this is small enough, I'm going to go ahead and slide this right back into a Ziploc bag. However, as your piece becomes too large, you're going to use a trash bag to wrap up your work. You may want to glide your sponge over your form to add a little bit of moisture if it's beginning to dry out or if it's on the stiffer side of leather hard. This will add just a little bit of moisture prior to wrapping it up. I want to show you how you achieve the shape that you desire in your vase form. I have an example here of a vase form that integrates those teardrop shaped coils as well as the addition of a little clay bead or button that then has the texture of a glaze brush handle in it. I also integrated some stamping again of that glaze brush handle. But if you notice the coils are curving in, if you're trying to achieve a shape where the coils are moving in, when you stack your coil on top, you want to shift it in a tiny bit. So I'm going to show you what I mean by that by continuing to move this form in on this side of the pot. So again, you want to make sure that you are always cross hatching between a day's work. So this was a coil piece that I stopped working on yesterday. So I'm going to take my cross hatching tool and cross hatch very deep, supporting that outside so you don't accidentally break off clay in an area. So I'm going to go ahead and get this cross hatch the whole way around.
So for this form, I'm going to continue to go in on this side of the form, but start moving directly up on the opposite side of the form so you can see the difference in where I place the coils. So first I'm going to roll coils as a review, making sure that I bring the coils to a point on the ends. I'm going to add a little bit of moisture, which is my slip to that coil. Now notice when I place that coil on there, it's going slightly to the inside of the form. So it is placed slightly to the inside of the form. Then, since I want the other side to go straight up, it's a little bit higher, a little bit further along than the one side, I'm going to stack the coil ever so slightly out so that the form can begin to go straight up and create the neck of that base form. So now on this side, I'm ready to also stack slightly up. So now you can see that I changed the direction in which my coils are moving simply on where I stacked the coil. So now let's talk about how you can finish the form. I have a few examples here of completed vase forms. You'll see that they're a lot lighter in color than what I was just working with because they are bone dry. I do recommend that if you're transporting your work from home to school that you keep it leather hard. Do not let it completely dry out at home. It's a lot more fragile in the greenware state. But let me show you some of the shapes in which you can see the coil construction moving in and out and then how I finish the form. For this base shape, you can see that the form curves in, so I was stacking my coils in, then I stacked a coil straight up, and then I began slightly stacking them out. I brought the form to a visual end by creating a little decorative element to the top, and the top edge just ever so slightly flares out. So that is a way to let the viewer know that this is the end of the form, and it wraps your eye back down into the form. Here's another example of a completed base shape. I brought a visual end to this form simply by flaring out the rim of the form. But again, you can see that my coils change directions by stacking in and stacking coils out. And finally, I have this base shape that to bring a visual end to the form, I move that coil down and wrapped it around um, a point on the form that is a little bit lower. So that brought the visual end to the form. It also flares out just ever so slightly.